Amen. Praise the Lord. We have been having as a theme for the last few weeks from Luke chapter 2, where I'd like to begin to read Jesus, Saviour and Lord, both Saviour and Lord, considering that there's lots of talk of the Saviour, there's songs of the Saviour, but of course he's both Saviour and Lord. And began this uh, series beginning in December looking at those words, his Saviour, the sozo that we've spoken of uh, quite a lot over recent months, particularly that first time Pastor Adam came and spoke and shared on the, 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 deep, the depth of that word and the definition of that word. And who's Christ, the anointed one, the Lord, which means actually supreme master, Lord of lords, King of kings, if you like. Let's have a read Luke chapter 2, again, verse 8 to 20, I'm going to read this morning. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in a swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Hallelujah. Born to you is a saviour who is Christ the Lord, one who would bring salvation in so many ways, a constant saviour, a daily saviour, yes, not just our saviour for the next life. And a lot of people will go to church that don't normally go to church in these coming days, beginning this weekend, or maybe already have been to a special Christmas service because they want to pay honour to the saviour that they need for the next life. But he's much more than that, isn't he? He's a saviour every day. He's a deliverer every day. He's a redeemer every day. And I need him to save me every day. Not because I've got a sin problem that I need him saving from. I just, I need him saving in my humanity. I need him saving him to save me from the sin of the world. It's effect on me. I'm completely dependent on him. And he said, unless you become a child, you won't be able to enter the kingdom and lay hold of this. You know, we do talk about what God has made us, but he hasn't made us something so we don't need him anymore. And if anything, this Christmas should remind us that we are in constant need of him. And we need to meet him and we need to lay hold of him and we need to be where he is. And we need to walk where he walks and we need to be in his presence and we need to know him and have him amongst us. And that's our desire in this church. There's been a big push in the last couple of years on the increase, laying hold of the presence of God. And I know that Pastor Neil and Grace are going to keep us, if not drive us more in that desire to, lay, to, to be where Jesus is. He's here all the time, but we want to know he's here. We want to experience he's here, this saviour constantly delivering me. Because it also means he protects you and he keeps you. It, ha it carries the meaning of prosperity. He prospers us. Jesus, the saviour, who is Christ, and that's the anointed one. He's the one who's been chosen. For them, they were looking for this Christ, this deliverer, this Messiah. He is the Messiah. He is the one. He's the one to follow. There's not another one. And we're reminded that at this Christmas. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. There's no other way to the Father except by me. He's the anointed one. He's the one anointed to save us. Other things can't save us. He's not one of our options. He is the one. And that might be offensive to some, but he's the one. And there's no other one. There's no other one but Jesus to save us. It doesn't make everything else that people look too bad. It just can't save them. We're not about condemning what they look at, but we are here to condemn, I guess, or put down any message that would suggest there is another saviour apart from Jesus. There might be some other good things, but they're not the saviour. 
who Jesus is. They're not the souls of the Christ is. He's the anointed one to be that. He was anointed and made to be that. And he is also Lord, Master, Supreme Master, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, both Saviour and Lord. And as I mentioned when I began this series, first impacted really by this verse at a Christmas service in Vanuatu, 3,000 people there, and David Lover Senior said, he might be your Saviour, but is he your Lord? And I thought, <laughs> it kind of killed the celebration, to be totally honest. 3,000 people were dead silent for 30 minutes as David kind of hammered us about what it means to make him your Lord. And, I, and he goes, I know you want his saving, but do you want his Lordship? Do you want his lordship in your life? And we've, we've spoken about that and, and we've heard about that even on a number of occasions over this last week. And verse 12, I want to look at this morning. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. This will be a sign. Straight after they, they mentioned this sign, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God. They, the glory of God came upon them. They saw all these angels singing. There was definitely a great fanfare, a great celebration, uh, an elaborate display, an extravagant uh, presentation at the birth of Christ for these shepherds. And we could even say then at the visit of the wise men, there was also extravagant gifts given. As I've heard messages preached again, one by the founder one time, Jesus wasn't poor, he began his life with all these very expensive gifts. I guess the uh, escape for uh, Joseph into Galilee was well funded by the gifts of the wise men. And uh, these are extravagant gifts and this is an extravagant presentation. Yet this is the sign that you'll recognise him, that you'll find him in a barn in a feed trough. You'll find him lying in a feed trough. We've got a beautiful um, display in our foyer this morning and that's all been put together again by Mr. James Baresi. So we want to give him a big hand and a big thank you. It's a really great presentation and we have the manger there. And it's basically a feed trough. That's what, that's what the saviour of the world, the anointed one, the Lord of Lords, the master of all masters, the king of all kings, is, is, you'll find him in a feed trough in a barn amongst the animals in the cave some even suggest that it was probably possibly even a cave and he was that's where you will find him and I guess I particularly want to look at the word this will be a sign this is the exact same word that's used in Mark that those who follow Jesus these signs will follow them it's the same word and in that time it's, it's it also carries the meaning of wonders or marvel this is the marvellous thing. This is the, this is the wonder. This is the sign. This is the incredible thing. This saviour of the world, this Lord of lords, the anointed one you've been looking for all this time, the king that you've been looking for to deliver you, that, that has been spoken of through generations by the children of Israel, this sign that he's really here, this is a sign for you. This is also a marvel for you to think there's something in this. He's in a feed trough. This is a sign. This says something. It's not just a sign of how to find him. It says something. Because the Lord said, these signs will follow those who believe. They're pointers, yes? This points to something. The fact that he's been born in a manger points to something about Jesus. Points to something about his lordship, about how he's going to be master. How do I get to know the master? How do I encounter the master? It says something about his saving, where his saving will take place, where you find him. And I want to suggest to you this morning is where we found Jesus born is where we'll always find him. There's a humility in his birth that remains. This is how he ministers on earth. This is where you meet him on earth. This is where he is number one. This is the place where he's most powerfully experienced. Is in these, these humble places, in this humility. We're challenged in this Western world. We want to, we're, we're seeking and desiring to lay hold of the manifest presence of Jesus. We're looking for, to want him to do the signs and the wonders, the works. And, you know, one of, part of our problems is to humble ourselves, to bring ourselves to a place of humility where that power can flow as it does in the place of humility, to bring us to a place of almost desperate for it as it does flow in a place where people are desperate. You see it in Africa. You see it. 
I see it again in the South Pacific, again having visited there for the last 10 days, seeing a manifestation of this Jesus, of this humility that he has and of his power in the humility, in the humble places, in the humble places. Just like a few other things about Jesus I want to remind us of this morning. Like in Revelation, a message I looked at earlier in the year, the announcement to John that the one found worthy to open the scroll of which would carry out the will of God on earth was a lion. The lion of Judah has done it. The lion has achieved it. The lion, it says, has overcome. As you imagine a lion would do. And when he looked, he said, what did I see? I saw a lamb. The lion was a lamb. He did his work as a lamb. He didn't do his work with mighty claws or a big roar or his massive teeth. Although he's a lion, he came as a lamb. A lamb has no self-defense. A lamb has no way of defending itself. All it does is bar and kind of run, but they don't even run very well. They kind of run in a panic. They suffer with deep anxiety when things are bad and they run around in circles. They're just the easiest pickings. They don't defend themselves against an enemy. They have an innocence, an inability. They, they don't protect themselves. The lion of the tribe of Judah became a lamb. He made himself a lamb. He made himself defenseless. He made himself so humble, just as he did at his birth in a feed trough. No protection, no guards, not in a palace. No, no acknowledgement that, hey, the saviour of the world has been born. The king of kings, the lord of lords has been born. We need to put some guards on the door. When a child is born to the royal family in England or any of the royal families of Europe, there's high security. No security for Jesus. You'd be sure King Herod had security. That's what temple guards were. The high priest had security he had guards to watch over him. The Caesars all had security. Every ruler of his day had security. So I'm going to look for this Jesus. Do I got to get past the security? There's none except a donkey maybe. I don't know. There's no security for him. There's no fan for him. He's in a feed trough. That's where you'll meet him. That's where you'll encounter him. And it's affected the, the, the shepherds, didn't it? They, it still did affect them greatly that they had gone and met the Lord in this feed trough. The lion came as a lamb. Jesus says himself, I'd like to look at um, Luke 22, verse 27. And this is Jesus with his disciples in Luke 22, 24. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger and he who governs as he who serves. Who is greater? He who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. Who is greater in, the, in your culture? Who is the greater one? You enter the room, who's the greater one in the room? The one sitting at the head table that's being served by everybody. He's the greater one. That person's the greater one. He's, he, he's, he's taken to the head table and he gets served by everybody. And I'm reminded of this every time I go to Vanuatu. That's what they do. They have this thing. And if I try and go and eat with the people, everybody's freaking out because there's a special table for me and I'm not sitting at it. And I realise I just mess everybody up. I mess up all the plans and everyone's offended and the women are running around saying, we prepared the table, we put the cloth and the flowers and Pastor Peter's sitting down there with the other pastors. And they just stand around saying, the table's there. I say, yeah, I'll come in a minute. The table's there. Finally, I just say, okay, I'll go and sit on the table. That's supposed to be that I'm, I'm the greater, I deserve this honour. I'm pretty convinced Jesus is sitting with the other guys. He's not with me at the table. That's the problem. Because <laughs> he said he doesn't sit at that table. So they always make me sit on my own and I don't even have Jesus sitting with me. <laughs> I said to a couple of leaders who get to sit with Pastor Peter at the table one time, I said, you know, Jesus isn't eating with us. He's over there. He's out the back with the boys that set the tables that are getting the scraps when we've all finished and had enough. That's where he'll be eating. They're like, what? I said, oh, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't you have him with you all the time? The whole theology of that was totally throwing them off. But, but he made the point. It's true. Who's, it's the person at the table. But he says, but I don't. Yes, I don't. 
I am among you as the one who serves. This humility, this place of serving, that's where you will find the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Serving, where serving is needed. Where do you serve? Well, where there's a need. So he'll be there at that place where the need is. He said in Matthew 8, 21, that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. This is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He says, I actually don't have a place to lay his head. He told us in Luke 14 that when you go into a room, go and sit in the lower chair or sit on the floor and wait till someone invites you to the higher chair. This is how he operates. This is this humility. This, there, will, there will be a sign for you. This is a sign. That the sign wasn't that there was nowhere else for him to go or he was trying to sneak into the world so nobody would kill him. There's, the fact that he's in a manger is a sign as much as a miracle. It's the same kind of sign. The miracle and the things that follow those who believe that we desire and want to lay hold of, the purpose of them is compassion. He has great compassion to heal the sick, but he wants to do signs and wonders that people will see him. Well, the great sign at his birth was that he was born in a manger, that he came in in such humility. This is a sign. There's something here for us, that he came this way. Matthew 23, 11 to 12. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Totally opposite again, yes? This will be a sign for you the saviour of the world, the king of kings and the lord of lords, the one anointed to save all of us and to be boss of all of us, to be over every single one of us, the one who's lord of all of us, the one that every one of us will one day stand before, the one that will make judgment over your life and my life, the one that has all authority to save us and deliver us and has a book in which it will decide who does and doesn't go to heaven. The guy that has all say over everything and everyone is in a feed trough. What's he doing there? We all need, we need him to lead us. What's he doing there? What, what do you mean you're going to serve and not sit at the head of the table? We need you to sit at the head of the table because we need a leader. And you're the leader. We, we don't want to put another one there because he doesn't carry the anointing to save us. He doesn't have the ability to save us. We've got a leader with the power to save us, the ability to deal with sin and death. He's the son of God. He's the king of every king and the Lord of every Lord. And we need him to lead us. And he says, yeah, I will, but I won't be at the head table. We need a lion. He said, yes, I am, but I won't be like one. I'll be like a lamb. A lamb. Lambs can't do anything. Lambs have no strength and no power. Well, my power and my authority will be in my lambness, my humility. The fact that I'm a lamb. And this will be a sign. It started right at the very beginning. He started this way and he remained this way. And he lived this way. And I suggest to you he still is this way today. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, it says in John. James chapter 4, verse 6. God actually resists the proud. If, if I take the higher seat and I think I deserve the higher seat and I think I should have this table because, hey, I'm the leader here, I'm this, I'm immediately taking an attitude which actually the word says God resists that attitude. And that's why Jesus said, when you come into room, take the, the lower because God gives grace to the lower. But he resists the one that somehow thinks I'm worthy of this and I'm worthy of that. He resists that. And it's a battle for great men and women. It's a battle for people that have power and authority in the kingdom of God. Because the the voice, the humanity will say to them, you deserve your this, your that. But actually he will resist that. When I was in um, Africa with Vass and Claudia, we went to a cell group night. And uh, the cell group was at the slum. And so we're going at sunset, so we began to drive down these wide streets that became narrower narrower streets. 
and they got narrower and narrower to I wasn't convinced we could fit the big car that we're in even down the streets. We got to the point where we could drive no further and we got out of the car in the dark and then we began to walk down these laneways that just got narrower and narrower. And I'm just thinking, this is not, this is not, this, this is sort of a little scary, this scene, a little bit exciting. I did think of my sister-in-law. I thought, I just don't see this as Claude's scene. I'm married to her sister. What, this is not their scene. And we're walking down this place. I do kind of think it's Vassa's scene, to be honest, living in a village hut somewhere. But I just thought, it's not particularly mine, and I know it's not my sister-in-law's. It's not our, you know, it's just something that... And, I remember, and then we got to a place, as we're going further down, and I started to get to the point, we're going to get to a house soon, aren't we? And we just kept going deeper into this slum. We actually ended at the very bottom of the slum. The slum was on the side of a valley, and it ended up at a swamp, and we ended up at the back wall of the slum, against the swamp. And our last few metres... The footpath turned into the sewerage, not, not number ones and number twos, but the sewerage that is coming out of the sink. And we got level with one pipe, Vass and I, and they decided to undo the plug and out the dishes, water, and everything fell on our feet. And someone said, oh, oh, oh. something in language was a bit too late because the water was now all over us. So we walked down the last part of the path like this because the sewerage is flowing between you. And I'm looking again up at Claudia. She's walking like this. To have cell group. And I remember saying in my mind, because you do, I tend to, people often say, when do you talk to the Lord? I just say all the time. And I said, gee, Lord, this is now uncomfortable. And he said, I'm very comfortable here. You know, you hear those voices, it is like a, per, like, did anyone else hear that? Because, did anyone else hear him say that? It was that loud in me. I said, Lord, this is uncomfortable. And I knew I was more uncomfortable because I don't think it was this guy had moved house, so I knew Vass had never been here before. So really, my host doesn't really even know where we're going. And I just remember saying, Lord, this is uncomfortable. And he said to me very clearly, I am very comfortable here. And I did, and it was a rebuke. From him to me, it was a rebuke. I'm very comfortable here. And so then I just thought, no, I'm going to discard everything that's going on around me. We went into this little house and you were invited to make yourself a cup of tea. Everything in me said, don't make a cup of tea here. <laughs> but they're looking at you. So I made a cup of tea, prayed over it, blessed it, and ate a little bit of something. Because I just thought, well, Jesus would. He absolutely would. He's very comfortable in that humble place. He's very comfortable amongst that humility. That's where he is. And of course, this is always, my brother-in-law's got a, cry of his heart he loves to go to these places because he always feels the Lord is more there than other places and this is very real if you get an opportunity to go with Jesus to a place like this you will experience him in the, in the humility of that place the humbleness of that place some would say it's it's the need it's partly the need it is the need and the brokenness he goes to where the need and brokenness is but there's a lot of need and brokenness even amongst wealthy people heart brokenness I don't, I don't know that the brokenness is any different I think the issues are different but to me, I sit with people and Solomon's words, nothing new is under the sun. We get, we, you have prayer amongst these slums and everyone's asking for prayer for their relationships. I had a big prayer time in Solomon Islands this last trip. And uh, again, I had others praying and President Seth came and, said, came and said to me with tears in his eyes, he goes, with all the physical hardship here and the lack of medical care, he goes, out of the 12 people I prayed for, 11 were for family relationships. And I said, nothing's new under the sun, is it, President? So, it's, you know, I'm not saying we have less need here. I'm not saying we have less need and they have more need. So Jesus, where the need is, there's just a humility. There's a humility. There's a humbleness in that place. The, the, the humility of the place, the humbleness of the place. And Jesus is very comfortable there. He's very comfortable there with the lowness, with the, rather than the, than the fanfare, Yes. And the honour and, the, and, and the, the bright presentation of him, I suppose, is, that, is the humility that is in this place and the dependence on him and the looking to him. You want to know the saviour, you want to know the master, well, you'll find him in the most humble of places. You'll, most fi you'll find him in the most humble of service. That's where you'll find him. That's where you'll have powerful experiences with him.
as we, as we go and do the humble thing, as we go to the humble place, we're going to meet him there. And it's, and it's going to take humility. And you, you want to do great things for God. Well, then it's going to at times require us to humble ourselves. And part of humbling ourselves is, is yeah, wearing the flack or wearing the, 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 the abuse or wearing the criticism and just saying in, in that experience, be humble, keep your tongue, close your mouth, forgive. That all takes humility. Pride says, I've had enough. Pride says, no, they shouldn't speak that way to me. Pride says, humility just allows it to take place. Jesus spoke strongly to the, to, to, against um, false doctrine. Jesus spoke strongly against false prophets. He spoke strongly against injustice to others. But you don't find him yelling in his own self-defence. But he did speak strongly when he saw injustice. He spoke strongly in defence of the truth. Oh, absolutely. We're not talking about hum- humbly allowing the truth to be trampled on. But, but you will meet Christ in that place of humility. And interestingly, the glory of heaven came. And it, I guess heaven wanted to and needed to express the glory. Heaven was celebrating the birth of the Saviour with powerful glory and shouts and angels yelling doesn't actually always say they're singing, was my brother Trevor years ago used to say the angels didn't sing. Show me where the angels sing. And it actually says they shouted. They called out. They declared. And so it's almost like they're too excited to sing. Yeah, You don't burst into song when your favourite team kicks a goal. You tend to yell. Or when you hear good news, oh, you yell. Hey! You don't tend to go into a chorus. So I guess they were yelling, hey? Heaven was yelling with joy. And they just needed to, to express that joy. Someone needed to be told. So God says, okay, you can tell the shepherds. Why, don't, why didn't the angels appear in the house of Pharaoh? Oh, sorry, in the house of the Caesar. Why didn't, why didn't the angels appear in the house of the Caesar, in the house of the Roman governor? It could have made it a lot easier. He went to people with no power to actually exalt Jesus as he, we would say he deserved to be exalted. He went to a group of people whose humility was such they went away and could do what? Just tell other people. They had no power to build Jesus a a throne. They had no power to build him a castle. They had no power to do anything much more with this great revelation. It's funny, you go to the... uh, to Africa or I go through these trips to the South Pacific and I just meet people who have had such incredible encounters with God like we pray for here and they don't have any power to get anyone else to know about it. They don't have any power to gather any glory to themselves because of it. They can't even really broadcast or get that story out effectively and get on the circuit and get paid well to travel and tell their story. They have no ability to do that. And they're sort of like children. Well, isn't that what's supposed to happen anyway? We have these healing times and I kind of get a little, kind of be, be a little frustrated because I thought, you know, well, let's tell, share some testimonies. And I watched on the, the other last Sunday that everyone who came physically went back saying, I'm better, I'm better. Yes, I'm definitely better. They came expecting to feel physically better and they went back to their seat feeling physically better and didn't even think it needed some big fanfare because what, isn't that what's supposed to happen anyway? Isn't that why that guy came? Isn't that what, you know, it's like hugging the doctor and worshipping him because he gave you a tablet that took your pain away. They're like, well, why would you do that? That's what you've come to do. You said Jesus does it. Thanks very much. We're going to get the lunch ready. And it's like he does these amazing things even amongst the humble that can't even make a man-style glory out of what he's done. They don't even have the ability to do it. But when you are there, you meet him with great power and might. We've been ministering in Solomon Islands as as long as we have in Vanuatu. In fact, the founder of this ministry went to Solomon Islands on a trip and then went to Vanuatu on the same trip. First Solomon, second Vanuatu. He went to Solomon's at the invitation of some Solomon Islanders and ministry began out of that visit. And then he went to Vanuatu and he met a man on the beach and the, the rest is history in Vanuatu with its over 100 churches and thousands of people that are gathering today. But not just that, the thousands of lives that have been touched, how many independent churches have grown out of us, I couldn't tell you, and people in politics and business and even in other parts of the world affected by the, the, the work of this ministry. How many people come and shake my hand that aren't in our church anymore and a pastor for someone else and say, I just want to come and shake your hand, thank you for NTM. I studied in NTM, I'm over here now. And... The effect that that ministry had in Vanuatu was huge. It, 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 had, it saved a nation, really, from 
uh, coups and all sorts of riots and things. They've never experienced what happened in Solomon's, in Fiji. They don't see it. And it, that influence. But Solomon said at the same time, and it's always struggled and been much smaller and still is to today, though beginning to grow. And we sent there, the beginning of this year, a new leader. His name's Eric Harry. He's, he was our, they call him vice president. He was over a province on behalf of our ministry, Tafia, which is Tanaf, Anaitum, Fatuna, Eramanga a bunch of southern islands and he really grew that into a strong ministry and also increased in churches and planted a bible college for us in that whole province down there and eric offered he heard there was a need and he offered to go and i thought he is the man to go and we've we sent him and just going there now this visit after he's been there for nine months the only way i can describe it is there's a change in the atmosphere on our property, in our church. I couldn't even say there's a great increase in numbers of people. If anything, I think some people have left because they haven't liked the change. But there's a change in the atmosphere. And this is a very humble man and his wife, very humble. Yet when he speaks, with, speaks to me, when it comes to the truth and what he believes is of Christ, he, he's very, he has great authority when he speaks. And he won't bend the truth. But he's a very humble man. And again, I, I felt, Lord, I said, Lord, there's a complete change in the atmosphere here. And, and I, I turned to them when I left. And again, humble, but you know what's, a, what's happened. And I said, you know what, Eric, the atmosphere has changed. And you've really brought something very powerful and special here. And the custom of his Melanesian culture would be to kind of humble and say, no, no, you know, no, no. He just said, yes, I know. <laughs> And I thought, you're humble, but you know who you are. You know what your job is. You know who walks with you. He said, yes, I know. Since we've come, there has been a change here. And all glory to God. I thought, that's even so not Ireland. <laughs> and it was only me and him. It wasn't like he got up in church and said, bless you all, I've changed the atmosphere. It wasn't like that. It was, and I said it. He didn't say, have you noticed that I've changed the atmosphere? No. Nah. Or you notice the change here? He didn't even ask the question. I went to him and said, I just noticed this change. And in a sense, to, and I, as I said, I really felt the Lord say, it's because of his humility. I can work with this man. I can work with this man. And a real struggle in the, in the culture of the Solomon Islander is a pride, a pride that comes from being an, a people that were oppressed or not oppressed, possessed, run by the British for so long. It has a it, you know, long-term um, your country run by someone else then getting your freedom and all the clashes that happen and the different tribes. It creates a sense of uh, fighting against any idea that you're less. It kind of creates this pride, if, you, if, if that makes sense. And we see it quite a bit in Africa. And it's a lot to do with how poorly they've been treated. They've come out like this. The warrior, the history, I guess, of their... their and there's a real pride there at receiving and being able to improve. And the pride gets so in the way of being able to improve for these very beautiful people. And yet he comes with this humility. He comes with this humility and God is working in that place. You know, if we want to meet the Saviour, if we want to meet the Lord, we're going to find him in the humble places. We're going to meet him in the hum humble circumstances. We're going to meet him at times when we feel we're being humbled. And sometimes if you cry out to meet him, he might say, well, you'll need to be humbled. Circumstances will need to humble you. He'll, he will use difficult circumstances. He'll use the, the attacks of the evil one. The fact that you're calling out for God to move, then the evil one will come against you and the Lord will say, well, I'll allow that to humble you. He's not the, he's not the one who caused it, but he said, I'll allow it. I still maintain Job, who Satan attacked, came out of the other side a better man, a different man. He went in there thinking girls weren't worthy of an inheritance, girls weren't worthy of a house, girls weren't even named and he came out the other side and he gave his three daughters an equal inheritance with the three new boys and, they would, and their names were put in the scriptures. Something happened. He changed. We see little changes that happened in Job and of course we knew that Job sought God and sought God and sought God and prayed and did sacrifices and wanted in all his heart to be right with God in all ways. And I think God used, he didn't say, I'm going to attack you, but he used the anger that, Job, that, that Satan had at the goodness of Job to even make Job better. Thus James says, be, be happy, be joyful when these fiery trials come. Jump for joy and celebrate because he talks about the things that will develop in you as a result of these fiery trials. Then says, but never say God brought this on you. 
Never accuse God of bringing it on you. Your own lusts give you trouble. The devil gives you trouble. But God will even use the humility of that trouble to bring more of the Savior to you. We want more of him. Be ready to go to the humble place. You want to meet him. You're desiring a more powerful visit from him. And this is what we we desire to see in our church and our churches everywhere. Then it'll take a a humble experience. It might take humility. Be ready. He might be saying to you, I need to bring you to some more humble places for you to see and experience that power. I believe in the work that we're doing in Rwanda because it's by nature, it's so ripe for, for a manifestation of God particularly if the truth is delivered in the way that we know we can deliver the truth, particularly hearing people that are hungry and they're in the humble place, but the message leaves a lot to be desired. We're blessed with the message that I know for these humble people can release great power into their life and they will meet the Saviour who is Christ the Lord. They'll meet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in their humble place. And some of them will come and visit here and almost think, like some of our islanders do, you can have your lifestyle because I don't meet him there like I do at home. You just don't have him like we do at home. Oh, there's a lot of people in our church that say that to me. Not, not when they come, they love coming here and they love being loved by us. But when they look at our nation, they think you just don't have, there's something we have that you don't have and some of them have already realised it's your your lack of humility, (laughs) your lack of humble situations in which you can meet God and experience God. This is a sign that he'll be in a feed trough in a barn. That's where you will find him. And you know what, brothers and sisters, I guess I'm saying this morning, I am saying this morning that that is still where we will find him in those circumstances and those situations. The Lord is humble and he wants us to fully grasp this, the power of this baby, the authority of this Lord that was born to us. He became a man so that we as men and women could experience it. He became a person like us so we could meet him as a person and he could meet us where we are, but it's in humility. It's definitely in humility that he will, we will find him. It's in those humble circumstances that we will find him and we will meet him. Amen.